Okie dokie. So we are we are live. Okie dokie. Oh, so I've got it on. I've already. Live. I've, already <laughs> I've already. I've already. I've already messed up. <laughs> I, <laughs> just, <laughs> I broke the cardinal rule. Okay. Oh, anyway. Uh... Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas. Uh, I'm Emma. <laughs> I'm Chris, and and welcome to Paleo Party. Uh, this is a podcast where we invite a new paleo guest to hang out with us and talk nonsense about paleontology. Um, but paleontology, but paleontology, but Paleo Party is a podcast with a difference because we live stream each episode on Twitch.tv/slash Paleo Party, so you can get involved and ask us and our guests anything you like. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome our first ever guest to Paleo Party. She's doing her PhD at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, and she is a specialist in fossil poop. It's Hannah Bird! Hey! Hello, hello. Thanks for having um, me. So we're asking all of our guests that join us to attempt to explain their research using the OpGore 5 editor, which only allows you to use the most common 1,000 words in the English language. I have to explain a complex idea. Obviously, this is a bit extreme, especially Obviously, seeing as neither extreme. paleontology nor fossils are involved in these 1,000 words. Um, but it's a rather fun exercise. You can see ours on the Paleo Party website. And we've asked Hannah if she would attempt to do one for us. So take it away, Hannah. OK. Um, so unfortunately, who was none of the <laughs> top 1,000 words, which I, you know, debate. but. Uh, so mine came out as I look at old brown stuff from a long time ago. We use cool things to look inside the old brown stuff. We can tell who owns the brown stuff and who it was eating. I also look at hard body stuff from animals from a long time ago and the steps these animals made. Okay, that's, that's worrying true. because I am drinking brown stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I like that one. It's actually really straightforward. I'm really jealous of people who don't have to like explain computational stuff. Brown stuff, that is perfect. I mean, I had to, I had to push synchrotron scanning into cool things. <laughs> so you know. Yeah. Wait, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, your you said that you want that you look at poop, and there was, I, I definitely saw footsteps. Yes. So footsteps is in the top 1,000 words, or was, did you use two words? No, no, no. The, the steps these animals make. Oh, the steps oh. these animals take. My bad. That's, that's pretty good, in fairness. Well, how would you describe your research if you didn't have to use the 1,000 <laughs> most common words? Um, okay, so I look at material from East Greenland that dates back to the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. Uh, and it's a late deposit uh, that sits on the boundary. So essentially, my supervisors have gone over there um, over the course of seven years, seven field seasons, and collected a lot of material, I think over a thousand specimens. Uh, so it's my delightful job to kind of interpret these fossils. And um, a lot of the fossils are actually uh, fossilized poo, or known to us more so as coprolites. Um, and the kind of traditional methods of observing coprolites have been thin sectioning and um, trying to then make wax models. Um, but recently, uh, it's been discovered that synchrotron scanning is very useful to actually look inside the coprolites. And then you can reconstruct them uh, virtually using uh, 3D software. Um, so that's essentially, yeah, what I've been doing. Um, and I've also been involved in some uh, side projects. One of them is looking at some of the early uh, tetrapod trackways. So I've been involved in field work in Valencia Island in Ireland, um, where we got to uh, 3D scan. Yeah, 3D is a big. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we got the 3D scan the trackways, which is super cool. Um, and yeah, I help out in some field work in the south of Sweden, looking at some. Um, late triassic material um and deep time tides uh, tides tides yes that's how i got into paleontology in the first place was through tides how did you get into paleontology through tides this um, is I, this is kind of fascinating because i also love tides oh <laughs> and Everyone. weirdly enough i have also worked on paleo tides 
I'll just really? see myself. Yeah. Like, oh, amazing. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Um, so it was through my master's. And well, okay, this is this is a bit of a story time. Are we, are we ready for a wee bit <laughs> of a story yeah. time? So it all started way back in February 2016, I want to say. I think it was 16, actually. Um, where Professor Steve Balbus from the University of Oxford came to give a talk at Bangor. And he's head of astrophysics there. So I kind of saw his talk of kind of linking astronomy and the evolution of life. And I was like, oh, this looks like it's going to be worth uh, worth going to. Um, so yeah, so he essentially started describing, you know, how he has a big interest in the Earth, Sun, Moon system and, you know, how, what's so special about that and why we have life on Earth today and, you know, and observing exoplanets, you know, what kind of special criteria should there be for, for life on Earth? So he kind of starts off with all his kind of uh, gravitational forcings and all these equations. So I'm sat there like, oh, geez, I'm lost. <laughs> um, but he, he br essentially brings it into the kind of the gravitational forcings of the, the moon and the sun, uh, despite how different the, um, the mass of both these uh, objects are, and also objects, not a great word, but we'll go along with it. Um, and also the different distances from the Earth, um, the, uh, the forcing is only out by a power of two, and this gives you modulated tides. So that's why from one high tide to the next, there's a slight difference. So we kind of thought, okay, you know, what period in the evolution of life could this be quite critical? And he looked upon the Devonian period when fish started to move on to land, and he noticed the continental configurations um, could be optimal for what's called tidal resonance. So essentially, like you're tuning a guitar, you know, you get you hit the right note. Um, so when you get an ocean basin of a certain width, then you get larger tides. So um, and the, the idea of tidal ranges influencing the fish tetrapod transition has kind of points around for a while. You have like Romer with the drying pool hypothesis um, and other paleontologists have suggested uh, similar, but they haven't looked at it from a Kind of numerical point of view, they've always, you know, looked at the fossil kind of side of things. So he said about um, doing a numerical model, and so there's some basis for large tides. And so his next thought was like, okay, we, we should try and do this. Um, sorry, a theoretical model. Then he wanted to do a numerical model, and so he was like, oh, okay, well, I'll contact the oceanographers in Oxford. They were like, oh, we don't do this kind of thing, but there's this crazy guy up in Bangor, who's my supervisor, uh, who uh, who does things like this. So, so after I went to the talk, I was like, I really want to do this. So yeah, that essentially went down that uh, slippery road down to paleontology. So it was a big collaborative effort. So there was myself, my supervisor, other people from Oxford. Uh, per Alberg was involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how I got contact with him. Um, and yeah, I went about uh, making tidal simulations from the late Silurian into the, the middle Devonian, uh, which I can happily say it's been quite the road to get it published, but it was, it's been accepted. Uh, hey, oh, congratulations. So, so yeah, people will be able to, to read up on that soon. So yeah, it's quite, Yay. quite epic. Oh, nice. In awe of everybody who gets to publish their undergrad and master's thesis, mine is still going around in circles. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's been quite the quite the slog. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. We we almost got accepted somewhere, but it it la like very late got yeah, yeah. blocked by some people. So, so well, I guess this is what took you to Uppsala. Just the general um, progression. Oh well, yeah. So through through doing the Thai stuff, then I was trying to like you know marry it in with the paleonto paleontological record and the more I looked at it because I'm not going to lie I was really naive I was kind of thinking like paleontology was just dinosaurs uh, which well, no offense well. dinosaur people that's that's totally fine just see Thomas my cup of tea. in the back <laughs> <laughs> I'm just moving forward to be more comfortable I'm definitely not I'm definitely there was no preempting that uh, but I mean no I and I think it's also like a, a huge Part of ignorance on my side like the more i've learned about dinosaurs the more i have respect i mean i think it's you always hear this you know t-rex 
and like you know you only hear about the big lads but there's there's much more big to ones. it you know the big much lads more. Well, talking of I'm kind of gonna add that. Yeah, talking of T Rex, we've already had one comment uh, in the chat saying that they love your shirt, Emma. Oh, so thank you. There's, there's obviously some T Rex fans in yeah. the chat already. That's great. Um, <laughs> we, we should mention actually, we are an interactive podcast. It's in. It's yeah. yeah it's, our, it's our vibe. So if you have any questions for Hannah or for the rest of us, um, send them in to the chat here on Twitch. Or you can send them into our Twitter handle, which is at Paleo Party. Um, and we strongly encourage them to be about absolutely anything, hmm. be that research or mundanities of life. <laughs> so if you want to find out about, I don't know, Thomas's favorite DM campaigns, then go nuts. Yeah, or Chris's <laughs> mustache routines yeah. uh, <laughs> no, for no, facial hair care. The comb that he uses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone logging in this evening expected it to be welcome to Paleo Tidal Party. But yeah. um, <laughs> so we've had up. we've had a we've had a good chat about Paleo Tides, which are pretty amazing. Like geological, it's amazing that from the rocks you can work out tides. And, and one thing that's very important that I think we should say at this point as well to our listeners is that tides. Um, well, what we consider tides today, as in sort of twice a day, every day, um, and also twice at night, so four times, um, is not the same in the geological past because the Earth and the Moon have been closer together and further apart at different periods of geological time. So months were shorter. Like in the Carboniferous, months were a lot shorter than they are today. So it is a pretty interesting and amazing um, research topic. But moving off on track, Hannah, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment and what your PhD yeah. is on? Yeah, yeah, of course. Poo. Yeah. So, Basically, I want to talk about poo. Yeah. <laughs> well, I get back to the poo stuff. Um, so, so yeah, so I work on a range of, of different coprolites. In fact, the, the morphotypes of coprolites we have is greater than the um, diversity in the body fossil record from this um, assemblage. So because it's a it's a lake it, it's quite a closed system so we only have um at the moment one um actinop species actinopteridian uh one what, what is an actinopteridian <laughs> it's a ray fin fish thank you <laughs> <laughs> um one acanthodian a spiny shark uh, species uh one chondrichthian sharky boy uh and um am i forgetting anything no i think that's it i think yeah so we only have the three the three fish species um mainly dominated by the uh the ray fin fish um but the the morphotypes of coprolites we have i think we have maybe six or seven um so you're kind of yeah it, it's it's quite interesting but it's a bit like a detective series that's how i like to view it because i also really love detective series um, but what's also really interesting is the fragments that we find inside some of the coprolites indicate to different species. So we have fragments belonging to probably another Actinopterygian or another Raffin fish species. Um, and we also probably have some tetrapod elements as well. So not just the fragments in size, inside, but also some of the size and the shapes of the coprolites um kind of indicate that they're tetrapods so how can we tell this um well back at that time a lot of fish had spiral gut valves um and uh somewhere in the fish to tetrapod transition this was lost uh they're still not quite sure how how high high up the tree but uh we do have quite a few like big big decent sized so I'm 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 holding up what, what <laughs> I'm trying to so oh, but uh, pair likes to pair likes to say like a big sized poo that you'd find from a dog in a in a park that kind of <laughs> size um so uh, and they're non-spiral so that kind of points towards that it's probably from a a, a tetrapod but that we're just not capturing in the in the body fossil record there. Hmm. So for, for for our listeners, I should just point out that a coprolite is a term for a fossil poo. 
Yes. Yeah, I, I did say that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes, to reiterate. Yeah. Um, I actually, so in preparation for this, I decided to look up a few things about coprolites. And just that you mentioned morphotype, I think is a good time to jump in with what I got, because otherwise it doesn't tie in at all. Whenever I hear something new, I always go straight to the paleobiology database, which I work on extensively, and I always check if it's there, or what else I can find from it, if it is there. And um, I've discovered it's quite hard to pick up coprolites in it because I, I work on body fossils so I have no idea about the other realms within the database that aren't body fossils but I decided just to type in like coprolite and uh, I came up with a single like poor insect species from somewhere in Germany and it was it wasn't very interesting but I did want to know like ignotaxa so like taxa from trackways where you see the footprints they, they'd come with their own species names and genera that don't really equate to body fossil names and is that the same for coprolites uh yes and do you have any so, cool names as an extension of that question um so i don't and it it's a <laughs> bit of a deliberation i think between uh coprolite researchers i know some really like to assign the ichnotaxa name to them uh, others don't um and you can understand from like a multitude of of, of places um and i, I think it does yeah I, I i don't know where i stand on that i mean i haven't assigned any yet so um but uh yeah it can sometimes i think maybe get a little confusing especially when you have the body for body fossil record name and then the name for this ichno species of, of a coprolite or a trackway um and then, but at the same time, then, if you're trying to, I mean, that is one of the troubles that you have with uh, ichnofossils is trying to assign it to a body fossil or to a producer. Um, you know, that you always have to take it with a pinch of salt, particularly with, you know, these big, large uh, non-spiral coprolites that we have, because we say, oh, they're produced by tetrapods, but we don't have tetrapods in the body fossil record. So we, you know, we have to be careful about um, you know, saying this for definite. So, yeah. So, you, so uh, what? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Chris. I'm sorry. <laughs> just so I'm, I'm just really curious. This whole like poo morphology thing. How? Yeah. Walk me through it. What do I find <laughs> stuff there? Like, cur okay. I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, curly boys, straight <laughs> boys. I'm not like. I'm just one of these things. Where I'm like, what? How many different varieties can you have? What? Um. Yeah. Okay. So for so for spiral coprolites, there's a little bit more structure, and I say that vaguely. But essentially, you have three types of spiral coprolites. You have the two main ones are amphipolar and heteropolar. Uh, so amphipolar is described as um, if the um, posterior uh, segment of the spiral exceeds 75% of the length of the coprolite, then it's described as amphipolar. What? And then hetero. This is more maths than I signed <laughs> up for. But, I, mean, okay, I like the way that you were thinking about the maths, whereas my first thought of the logistics of how you squeeze that out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, it's to do with the different spiral guts. So sharks, I always forget this. I looked this up earlier. That sharks have a particular one. So whatever shape, I think it's hetero. Um, I think they usually produce them in that shape, but uh, the likes of lungfish or like earlier raffin fishes, I think tend to be more amphipole. Um, and then you have this scroll coprolite, which I only came across recently, um, which has only been found in, in a, a couple of late Silurian coprolites from Ireland and Scotland. And it's essentially like if you're rolling up a paper, like it's just like a scroll. Um, so they're not sure. They, they think it's a det detritivore that may have produced it. But mm. yeah, it's, uh... This is fascinating. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea. So, I, yeah. I think my only insight into any of this was that like paper that went crazy on like newspapers and stuff about wombats and their square poop. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, wombats have square poop. <laughs> so weird. But I, I wanted to ask, me. I wanted to ask because you talked at the beginning of the episode about a synchrotron and for 
our listeners, a synchrotron is a huge piece of equipment. It's the size of several football fields, and it's basically a particle accelerator. So it fires electrons using a special gun into a big chamber that is controlled by very, very powerful electromagnets, and it speeds up this electron to about 99.9% of the speed of light. And it, the electrons fire around this ring until basically they're up to speed. And if you were to like map out the distance that these electrons travel, they would travel like around the solar system and back like several thousand times. Um, and they're just flying around. And then what we do is we use these magnets to bend the electrons really quickly. And that creates a special type of light, which emits some of the most powerful X-rays on the planet. So it's really good for looking inside fossils without destroying them. So I wanted to know, you, you talked a lot about using the synchrotron. Are you looking inside these poops? And if you are, what, what do you see? Uh, so yeah, so we, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about taking the, the, the copper lights to the synchrotron scanner. So we went to uh, ESRF um, in Grenoble uh, in France. <laughs> wow, and, what, what accent was that? <laughs> Grenoble? Is that how they say it? No. I, I mean, I, I have quite a few French colleagues that like to think some things. Okay, pa Paleo Party <laughs> would like to apologise at this point to any French colleagues that yeah. are listening. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so took, I think, 45 um, specimens to uh, the scanner there. So we had uh, two days um, of, of scanning session. And the thing about it there is that it's all the time. It goes 24 hours. So whenever a specimen stops, you have to be there, put it in, set it all up. Um, so uh, but luckily with the copper lights, you can just stack them in a tube. So as long as you record which ones were, then you can just put it in there, let it go for 12 hours. So you can have your nice uh, night's sleep and then so come it's, back. It's literally a tube of crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> crap tube. <laughs> That is a completely different experience that I've heard of other people on the synchrotron where they've been like bleary eyed, like staring yeah. at the screen where there's like, just stuff it in a tube and send yes, it off. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I had quite a, lot, a few jealous colleagues over that. But, um, <laughs> Can imagine. Yeah. Um, and we used one of the longest beam lines uh, there. So I think it's uh, BM ID, ID 19. I think that's what it's called. Um, so, uh, and do you want the full name of the kind of what it's called? Go for it. Yeah. So in it's... French accent, though. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll go back to that. Um, so it's synchrotron phase contrast microtomography. Very fancy. Nice. That, that's not on Afghor 5. <laughs> just, just a wild guess, you know? <laughs> uh, the cool things. That's, that's what Afghor 5 oh, yeah, so... <laughs> had to bring it down to. Um, so yeah, so essentially we get this fantastically high resolution, um, like really thin, uh, virtual, basically you get a stack of virtual thin sections. Um, and so maybe for a copper light that is, um, five centimeters in length, I might have 7,000 images. So 7,000 virtual thin, um, Thin sections. In fact, actually, um, to use it in the 3D um, imaging software, we have to bin it because it's so high resolution. Um, because yeah, because it's in TIFF. Well, it depends. Okay, it depends on which 3D program you use. But the one that I use, we have to use TIFF. Um, so you're talking like, yeah, like 300 gigabytes for those stacks of, of images. That is crazy to think 200 gigabytes of fossil crap. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Computationally very expensive. <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, who would have thought that poo would take so many gigabytes? Yep. Um, so, oh, uh, so yeah, so essentially then I use the, the 3D imaging um, software. So I use Mimix. Um, another couple of colleagues of mine use uh, VG. Um, but yeah, you, then you essentially just go through and try and threshold and yeah, work your way through. It's it's a bit like the Barney box and essentially like you vaguely know what's going to be in there, but you're not 100% sure. So it's quite exciting. So you'd be like modeling out this little uh, inclusion and you kind of think, oh, what's this going to be? And then you 
you know, click the kind of render in 3D and you're like, oh. So, so. You make reaction gifs of Hannah's research. Yeah. <laughs> So like once you've once you've got these these virtual three dimensional images, can you see things like bones and basically I guess you see the last meals of these animals? Yeah, so it's it's pretty incredible um, the preservation of inclusions in the copper lights, and that's why they're so valuable. Um, I think particularly when you have such um, maybe poor or flattened preservation of body fossils in an assemblage. Um, because when the um, the copper light fossilizes, it does it rather quickly, so it keeps its 3D dimensionality, which means the contents inside um, are quite well preserved. Uh, and I've discovered a, a lot of um, what was producing the copper lights that I've been working on didn't chew a lot, so there's some big fragments in there. <laughs> I guess this is at the time in the fossil record where the like jaws are rather primitive. I, I hope I'm like categorizing that correctly but everything is kind of like chew not chewing but like hacking it down yeah 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 um yeah jaw, jaws haven't quite the, i mean you, they have jaws but it's still still mm. the evolutionary process of yeah. like power and that kind of but fish yeah. like fish are, um like a lot of fish the way their jaws work is that they sort of overextend the hinge and then suck in loads of water and then whatever's there just get, happens to get sucked in too <laughs> right and they swallow it whole so and sharks, sharks are quite, well, they don't have the same jaw, but they swallow a lot of stuff whole if they can. A bit more munchy. Yeah. Bit more, bit, a little bit more bitey, I guess. So hacking it down yeah. and munchy, munchy and bitey are totally technical terms. These are all paleontologically <laughs> You can cite terms. us. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, so you get, you get to see their last meals. And I guess, so we've had one question, which is, um, do you find more poops belonging to predators or herbivores? So that's a very good question. So um, the answer is more from predators, much more from predators, so carnivores. Um, and that's because the, um, the carnivore cop or poo is more full of phosphate, and this helps in the fossilization process. Uh, herbivores lack this, so you have to have much more special conditions for um, herbivore poo to be preserved. Mm. So yes, yeah, so there is a bias or carnivore poops rather than herbivore poops. So that's, that's nice like, yeah. Crossover with Thomas. <laughs> well, I was just like my, so my research is how things turn into fossils. That's what I'm interested in. I actually am working on a paper right now all about fossilization and, and that sort of stuff. And you do get herb, herbivore poops, especially if they're eating very like phosphate rich, uh, like algae and stuff like that. But yeah, like you said, carnivores are much more prevalent because their bones and things are full of phosphate. So they turn to rock or phosphate rock um, a lot easier. Um, another question that uh, has been asked is, uh, does, the does the proportion of food remains versus the byproducts tell you anything important? So when you're, when you're looking at these fossils, can you make ecological inferences? That's, that's an interesting question. So I think <laughs> no. it's a code word for I have yeah. a notion. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's that's the scientist way of saying. Um. That, that's when you're at a conference and someone uh. just asks you that really, and it just buys you maybe like a few seconds. <laughs> and then you're like, turning around. I'll talk to you after. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I so one thing. Um, about copper lights. So the, the hard inclusions are very readily preserved. Um, and there is great potential for soft body preservation. But through the digestion process, most of that tends to be broken up versus the hard inclusions. Um, so just because you have a lack of hard inclusions, um, yeah, it's, it's maybe then hard to infer that, okay, maybe they're eating more soft body animals then versus those with with mm. harder elements in it um but um but a study actually one so there was a phd student who just defended martin Kornstrom. he's the kind of he's the he's the copper light king i'm just a mere mere mortal really <laughs> uh, i'm just hanging on the coattails to try and you know <laughs> uh yeah Try and replicate the uh, the work he's done. So he's worked a lot on on dinosaur copper lights, 
and he's worked on some copper lights that were pretty much like 90% like these huge bone fragments. Um, so, so that indicated, um, it's the os osteophagy, osteophagy? What, the eating of bones? Yeah, the eating yeah. of like bones. Yeah. Um, so that was quite, quite insightful from, you know, mm. that being so majoritive of, of the poop, then you could say, okay, that's probably then what, uh, what it was doing. Uh, and also it, it had, so the teeth were really well preserved. So there was these big bone fragments and also these teeth preserved. Uh, and they were so well preserved that they can be compared to the body fossils from that site. I think it was from Poland. Um, and it matched the, the producer that they predicted to come from. Oh. So it was probably through the Osophagy that it broke its own teeth and then Whoa. swallowed it. That's <laughs> crazy. That is cool. That is cool. That is cool. Well, oh. there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna change the the tact just a little bit away from away, away from your research, uh, just to let everyone know that in in America, a museum exists, which no, is a museum I... dedicated solely to fossil coprolites, and you can find Maybe. information on the museum at museum.com. But Do you work for them, or is this? <laughs> I'm just shouting them out. Um, <laughs> But our sponsor what, today. Yeah, yeah, our sp <laughs> I wish I should have approached them beforehand. But my question to you three is: Can you tell me what the largest poop, fossil poop, in the museum is? What animal made it, and how heavy do you think that poop is in kilos? Because we don't work in pounds and ounces here. Is this is this as a fossil, or it, is it is a fossil? It is a it is a coprolite. I will give you a clue. It comes from the Miocene. Mm. Oh, I actually think I know the answer to this. And I'm going to seem like an absolute idiot when I don't get it right. But is it a turtle? It Copper is not eyes. a turtle, I'm afraid. Damn. Um, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another clue. Is that it is named... This isn't a clue. It is named... <laughs> it has a name and its name is Precious. Jeez. So you could literally be like, you could hold it and be like, my precious. Is, okay, can we have a clue? Is it terrestrial or non-terrestrial? It's a little, origin? little bit of a, little bit of b. Oh come on! So, someone in the chat has said fifty kilograms. You are going to be very disappointed <laughs> when I tell you. Um. What? It's showing my ignorance of what was around during the Miocene. Oh, oh <laughs> hold on. Hannah, Hannah's just, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, it's quite clear that Hannah has just turned on her laptop. Her screen just lit up. She is going to Google. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just checking the age of the Miocene. Oh, well, I'm going to put you out of your misery. Um, <laughs> Precious is a 1.9 kilo fossil crocodile poop. Oh, oh, that is massive. Do I get like half a point for turtle because I was in the same ballpark? I mean, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, can we have a paleo party leaderboard? Oh, a point system. Oh, it's not going so well so far. <laughs> you should you should have like a quick round for like each of the guests. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking about that, but then I didn't want to like, what happens if our guest scored zero points in their own topic? That would be pretty sad. Yeah, so. but it, but that's like mastermind, you know. <laughs> yeah. The subject you're an expert in. And... Oh my god, there's nothing worse than watching mastermind and watching them get zero in their oh, own specialist yeah. subject. Yeah. Ouch! Um, no one, no um, one wants that. But uh, I think the biggest coprolite is uh, from big old T Rex, uh, and it's over thirty centimeters long, and it's seven kilograms. What? Well, in that case, no. I may have been mistaken. This might have been the largest poop in the museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I no, think right. you that, said that. Oh, did I? Yeah. Well, I just wanted yeah. to confirm that. So, can I, I, I just the thought... questioner isn't very good. <laughs> I'm gonna hold on. Jim Jam, Jim Jam, Jim Jam, Jim Jam. That's the that's the name. They they've just said in the chat. I have looked up a picture of this poop, and it is quite intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know why they think uh, it's intimidating. Yeah, well... Or do I? No, maybe I don't. I mean, a 1.9 kilogram poop, if you think about how it was excreted, is quite intimidating. 
just lovely. just lovely. saying just saying um, um anyway going so- completely off topic i saw um a person comment a while ago as to why there's bunting in the background um and i'm gonna answer on my background's behalf um they, I don't know if you can see, these are actually little dinosaurs on some of the little flags. Whoa. And the only uh, occasion that uh, that signifies was lockdown. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating lockdown. Nothing exciting. Oh, I just I just wrote I just wrote that we're having a paleo party. Oh, yeah. well, it works. Sorry. So, Chris, where's your bunting? Yeah. All right, I've got what Emma thought were brain scan diagrams <laughs> in the background. Turns out it's actually a decorative rug. Oh dear. So they swing some roundabouts. So I'll clearly you on the brain, yeah, like. <laughs> we got, gonna, we got a good question. We're going to have everything. We got have a good question from Natalia. And, um, which was that, um, where was it? Uh, <laughs> so she said she's working on a dinosaur game. And that she has been uh, regarding... Well, apparently the dinosaur game has dinosaur poop and weird shark poop. So, you know, take that. Take from that what you will. Um, but the question was asked whether dinosaurs would have flat cow-like poop. And I, I thought I'd put that to the to the group. What do you think? Do you think because they're quite tall that they would poop and it would... There's got to be you. some splatter from a height, you know. <laughs> It's just, I was just even way. like going way before that. Like you're assuming they have a herbivore digestive system, right? Well, that's that's what actually what I was going to ask next because if you think about cows and you think about elephants, their poop is quite wet, right? Do we would we? No, elephants is really dry because oh, some herbivores yeah. like suck all the moisture out. Oh, okay. Well, every day's a school day. <laughs> Do, have I just shown my hand as to how much I know about? Yeah. Why do you know so much about elephant poop? I, a, I used to work in a zoo, and B, I'm a farmer, so or I grew up a farmer. What, an elephant farmer? So, no, a cow <laughs> farmer. So I have relative experience with cow pads and elephant poop. No, but no elaborations, please. I don't want to go into that. So do elephants have flat poo or not? No, they. So if I'm not mistaken, and I could be could be wrong, but elephants, rhinos, and a few other in that kind of family or that group have really really dry excrement. Okay. <laughs> because they, they they absorb all the moisture from it because they have a predominantly like dry diet. Mm. So and that's do- one of the reasons why the wombat has the <sighs> square poop is because it retains a lot of the moisture because obviously it lives in a very dry environment. Mm. And then it's some somewhere in the gut process, then it gets packaged up in its own. Mm. But N- Natalia's made a counterpoint, which is that mammalian <laughs> herbivore poop is grass dominated, but that would not be the case in dinosaurs. So no, do we true. think dinosaurs would have wet, juicy poops is what I'm asking. Here, <laughs> I need an answer. And as our More resident dinosaur terminology. expert, Emma, I, I need an answer on whether they have juicy poops. <laughs> I love how for any of these answers so far, I've been drawing on my experience from working in the zoo and my <laughs> upbringing, not my actual expertise in dice. <laughs> um, I have a notion. I actually don't know. I don't even know where to go to begin with. Yeah. But there is an extension of this, is that there was a lovely little correspondence style paper that came out oh, maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, five years ago now, um, that like, suggested that sauropod farts could have contributed to global warming given the amount of methane that they could have produced so somebody has thought about this we just yeah. need to contact them that's amazing yeah i'm just <laughs> gonna go on a similar line because there's that famous other it's one of the best science diagrams ever of the sauropods throwing up its vomit onto a uh, velociraptor no less yeah oh no no it's supposed to have, like this is one of the suggestions that it killed something isn't it because it <laughs> fell from such a height that this this vomit has crushed something underneath i can't it's a genuine diagram from a paper but it's it's absolutely amazing that um, is yeah i mean being the same thing from the brachiosaur would not be pleasant for anyone i don't think i i actually i actually have a really good paleo poo story if you'd like to hear it um from we have a choice no you don't have a choice (laughs) so about uh during my phd a few years ago now um i was contacted by a member of the public who emailed our geology department and and asked for some help and this email was forwarded to me and basically he said that he had a piece of fossilized poo and he thought that it might be fossilized dinosaur poo 
and would I be interested in having a look at it? So I said, of course, bring it in and I will do my best to have a look at this dinosaur poo. And if it is, if it looks organic and we can work out what it is, then uh, I can, you know, contact some colleagues and we can see if we can work out what it is. Anyway, um, so he turned up and he, he had this little package and it was, um, it was about the size of a, a large, like sort of grapefruit. And it was wrapped in a blank, like in a, in a piece of cloth. Anyway, he pulled it out and he took it out. And it was this perfectly smooth brown rock that had a completely flat bottom. And it looked just like a piece of poop. And so he, he proudly presented me with this rock and said, is this poo? And as soon as I looked at it, I realized it wasn't poo because it had crystals in it. Um, and because of those crystals, you could tell it was probably made by some sort of igneous, like volcanic activity. And because it was so flat and the area that we, that the rock had come from, it was probably dragged there by a glacier in the last ice age and then dropped off when the, when the glacier melted. So it wasn't poo and I was very disappointed, but the best bit was afterwards when I was like, I'm really sorry. I don't think it's poo. Um, and he was like, no matter. I'm going to take it home anyway. And I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, I've been using it as a doorstop for the last 50 years. <laughs> I was like, okay. So he just had it sitting around in his house for like 50 years. And then he was like, yeah, I'm just going to randomly take it to some geology department, see if it's poo. What a build up <laughs> to have it for 50 years. I know. Yeah. The question. I know. Imagine waking up that morning and thinking, today's the day. Today is the day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is that. <laughs> Um, um, I wanted to move. Oh, sorry, Hannah. Do you want to go? No, first? no, I'm no, changing no, I was, the topic. <laughs> no, no. I was just just going to end with that. It, that is quite a quite an interesting one when you say, "Yes, I am a copperlite researcher," and then people just start bringing you stuff, and then they're just like, <laughs> "Oh God, copperlite, copperlite." And it is quite a difficult thing, unless you unless there's you can see any internal stuff and say, "Okay, yeah, maybe there's some pollution or something." Um, yeah, it's a bit. But, or like the spiral structuring yeah so yeah i i, I did um uh, an outreach day at the stockholm museum <laughs> in february and uh this lovely lady uh she just started bringing me stuff that was labeled as copper lights there and then she was like what is it is it and i was staring at it like <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Oh dear. I actually went into a museum. I was working in a museum just before lockdown in America. And there, I, the first room that I entered, there was a big box and on the box was a piece of paper and it just said, do we need this box full of termite poo? And I was like, I, I don't know. Do you? I hope they kept it. I really do. But... Um, I was going to change the topic to um, the Valencia trackways just because I'm afraid we might run out of time and not get to mention it because... Anybody who knows anything about Ireland's paleontology, it's utterly chaffed. It's not great at all. So we really hang on to the Valencia trackways as like our major paleontological thing. Um, you mentioned that you worked on them, though. So what were you actually looking at? Or can you describe them, first of all, for anybody who's not in, like gone to Ireland for these miraculous trackways? Yeah. Um, so, so a bit of history behind them. So they're discovered... I think back in 1993, I don't know if you're correct, by um, a Swiss paleontologist actually uh, called Ivan Stussel. Um, and I think he was there to look at the risk and orogeny um, and saw these kind of, you know, very, yeah, trackway looking um, holes as you were, well god they geez, are just the, brain, like the brain is dead today are they, all <laughs> they are basically just like uh like asymmetrical if that's the right word like something has gone along like very round little feet and just like yeah it, it essentially like, like, very very classical looking you know yeah. what, what you would expect from um kind of a four-legged trackway um and got in contact with some people yeah. and then um produced a paper I think in 96 um and yeah as you said then kind of put Ireland in the map of like whoa we've got something great um so the original trackways are the Dohillet trackways um and I think in in that specific site there's kind of six separate uh trackways with a couple of them being um quite long so yeah quite um 
quite neat little things. I mean, essentially the kind of size you're talking about is if you kind of um, kind of curled your fingers up and then kind of start walking just on like this bit. So yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Um, and then over the years um, in, um, in collaboration with uh, Ivan, some of um, my supervisors and, and other colleagues I've discovered many more trackways. So I think we're up to maybe 26 oh, wow. or so trackways across the whole island. Um, so a few more around the hill area um, and then towards the kind of northwest end of the island as well. So uh, I think we should clarify, we mean Valencia Island, not Ireland. Yeah, not sorry, not yes, the, the island, island of, of the island. Valencia <laughs> Island is a tiny little island yeah. in the southwest, like yeah, off yeah. the little bottom bit. The Ring of of Kerry. Yeah. <laughs> So not like 26 trackways in the whole of Ireland. We have some, we have more than that, generally yeah, speaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, or it's near the Skelligs, which were used in the Star Wars movies. Yes. That was really funny. Because oh, yeah, Port, McGee, Port McGee, it's the uh, village just off the island. On the island of Ireland, not on the island of Um <laughs> But uh, they really, man, they push hard home on the whole Star Wars has been filmed around yeah. here. Like they have Mark Hamill pulling pints in front of it. Uh, one of the restaurants and they have photos of this and they have like jumpers with like Star Wars. <laughs> but didn't they introduce porgs, which are an invasive species, the skeletons? Uh, That's what I heard. Yeah, terrible, terrible mm. for the local ecology. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so you've got, you know, lots of trackways, really lovely, especially when you get 3D scans of them. Uh, but we've got no body fossils. None. Nope. Well, okay, no tetrapod body fossils. Yeah, so no like pr no possible track maker fossilized in the surrounding rocks. Yes. Um so so we have to so I should clarify so the uh trackways are uh in what's called Valencia slate. It's her it, as soon as you hear the word slate you think uh oh it's been cooked a wee bit. Yes. <laughs> uh so yeah, so because it's been as part of the risk and orogeny, it's um yeah, been metamorphosed and different parts are metamorphosed to a different extent. Um, so obviously that doesn't really help in your preservation of, uh, of body fossils. But we do have lots of bits and bobs of uh, what's called Bothyrolepis, which is a placoderm, um, this in extinct uh, fish that had a lot of armored plates and whatnot. Uh, Donkleosteus is probably the most famous, mm. big, big lad. I think I think big, for big fishy lad. Also for uh, for our listeners at home, there was a certain look of disdain on Hannah's face just then when she said <laughs> that word. There was like, yeah, it's just a placoderm, isn't it? What? No, well, no, 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 no. Bothyrolepis. Any any placoderm researcher, <laughs> I think, will agree. And, and it, I think also it doesn't do it justice because I think it's also one of these um, um, trash bin groups. What? No, what's the waste bin? Waste bin. Waste bin. Yeah. Trash bin, like, sounds trash, <laughs> trash bin sounds like the American equivalent. Because yeah. um, I think there's over like 50 or 60 species in it. Oof. Or, yeah, so you think. Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, and, and God bless, I have a colleague here trying to work through scans of this cooked placoderm material. So, um, so, so I, so yeah, so I've been there on two uh, field trips, one in September last year. And then the year before. So, so the first year we went was basically kind of uh, looking more on the island. Um, so the, there had been, so Ivan had found the trackways, but there was a, I think a student at, at Plymouth University back in the 50s who had uh, found a couple of body fossil stuff on the mainland. So the, the slate formation extends onto the mainland to the south. Um, so you'd find a couple of pieces there. Um, so we went back to that site, find a couple of other pieces and uh, closer to the margin with the next formation, it's not as cooked. So it's not as deformed. Um, cooked, and then, also another technical term. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we have to leave it accessible to the people, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> we should we should adopt these more in our papers like it would make so much more sense it would definitely uh, i think it's fun yeah <laughs> i think it's also my lack of trying to reach these terms <laughs> it's late at night yeah. and it's an yeah. hour later for you yeah. so um 
so uh, yeah, and then last um, last year, then it was mainly uh, getting a lot of 3D scans, and um, hopefully we'll be um, submitting a paper soon on uh, our wondrous finds. Oh, we have we have quite an exciting one. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I don't think I can talk. About it. Um, but it's a trackway from something else. Oh, oh you're putting Ireland on the paleontological <laughs> map. This is amazing. Yeah. Imagine an international team of researchers. Oh. <laughs> also, like, do you not want to give a paleo party exclusive? Can you not like tell us what's going on? That's kind of it, though. Yeah, it's new. a trackway from something else. It's a trackway um, from something else. Yeah. If someone in the chat guesses it, is that uh, allowed? <laughs> no, I don't know. No. No, I can't see the chat. So oh, okay. You're, right. you're, you're safe then. Well, I think <laughs> someone's instantly replied Porg. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, we're moving into the last 10 minutes uh, of our stream this evening. So um, the keep the questions coming in if you've got some. But it's that, it's that part of the show where I get to ask one of my famous, pointless paleontological questions to the group. And uh, in honor of the fact that Hannah is at Uppsala University in Sweden, and Sweden has a heritage of Viking ancestry, my question for the group is, if you were a Viking raider slash shield maiden, what paleo animal would you ride into battle? Uh... And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it to Emma first. Without a doubt, a triceratops. Like, come on. You're sitting in behind its little yeah. frill, all cosy, you know? Great. What happens You're if it supposed looks... to be vicious, not sat there like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what happens if it looks up and squashes you in its frill? It, it'll have a harness to it that only looks down, right? <laughs> Chris, oh, is in this plan, maybe. What what paleo animal would you ride into battle, Chris? I think I think I'd have to go for the uh, the Viking kind of longboat approach and go for like a Shoniosaurus, one of the huge ichthyosaurs, because they're pretty they're pretty cool and they're massive. Um, be good for ramming other boats <laughs> and uh, with a big old snout. Absolutely uh, useless if you have to fight a pitched battle on land or storm a <laughs> castle, though. I mean, this is true, but you know, it's uh, it's every everyone needs specialty. Everyone needs some <laughs> these supports. You're, I've played between, them in Age of Empires. I know of us, how it works. <laughs> between the two of us, we have like on land on the sea. We've got we've got a cover. Got a cover. Yeah. You you've got your army and your navy. Oh it's... my goodness! Yeah, That's it. <laughs> Hannah, do you, do you have? <laughs> Hannah, do you have an animal that you would that you would ride into battle? I mean, I have a soft spot for the the marine side of things, so I think I think I go either Donkleosteus or Titanicthes, which is the the bigger yeah uh, Donkleosteus. So yeah, that's that would be terrifying. So giant... if I saw that coming towards me, yeah. But the the fact, well, how, okay, let's just talk for a second about the logistics of this. So are you are you underwater Aquaman style? Or are you sat like a like you know, just with your head above the water, skimming along really quickly, and actually all the people can see is you just being dragged along by a giant armored fish? No, I, I think I would do a bit of a like a, a submarine approach. Cool. So, <laughs> you want to come in like you know stalking, you know, and you want to observe. Yeah. And you can kind of then launch it when you want to intimidate. I think that's. I feel that's everybody a... else's ideas have had less flaws than mine, and they're not even on land. <laughs> <laughs> I like that someone in the chat has said that uh, Chris riding a giant dolphin looking thing dressed as a Viking is the manliest, least camp thing ever suggested. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with your mustache. It depends whether the ichthyosaur is allowed to have a mustache as well. Yes. Oh. The answer is always yes. <laughs> I was, what would yours be? I was thinking right. Arthropleura. Which is this giant, um, like massive millipede um, that was alive like four hundred odd million years ago? Um, just because I think a lot of people would just find it icky and would and run, run away. away from it. But also, like it's herbivorous, and I'd like to see people run away in fear of a herbivorous animal. I suppose you chose Triceratops, so you already you already get that. Why is everybody hating on Triceratops? I'm not. I was, that was a good thing. I was saying it's herbivorous. Okay. And it strikes fear into people because of its horns, I guess. 
true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just the way that you like portrayed it. You were like, oh, I just got to sit there really cozy. Or yeah. Like, oh, well, it's, it's, <laughs> I don't need anything else. I have its horns because it can do, you know, the, the fancy stuff. And I'll just sit there and like steer it occasionally. I've just right? got a, I've just got an image as well that like due to health and safety laws you're going to have to have like a bleeper on it when it reverses so it's like it will just beep as you move backwards like this vehicle is reversing. <laughs> I, I think all of our things are pretty I think one thing we haven't accounted for as a I mean I'm assuming we're all on the same side in this imaginary battle. Um, no one I did not say that for the record. <laughs> I didn't say that. None of us have accounted for speed. We're all, oh, like, yeah. as far as I'm aware, we're all fairly, fairly uh, sluggish beasts. Um, which I, you know, hope maybe it's fine, but slow and steady, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the, the millipede that would that would go in a fair whack if you wanted it to go top. How many legs? Like? Well, I think the problem is though is that the the Carboniferous, when it was alive, had significantly more oxygen in the environment than today. So my arthropleura today would be wheezing, and I think it would just generally be asthmatic and struggling. But but we have had a comment in, in the chat which said, how many Vikings can fit onto an arthropleura? And I feel like that's a paleo joke that needs to be explored further. Um, but they oh. finished off their sentence with, is it the paleo equivalent of a tandem bike? And I suppose, <laughs> yes, it is. That's, that's what I was thinking more of the mass transit of the Vikings than <laughs> warrior steed. Anyway, on that bombshell, <laughs> I, think, I think we'll leave it there for today. Uh, so, you know, I think all good things need to come to an end. So we've run out of time. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much uh, for everyone who's tuned in today. Um, we had way more viewers than we I thought we were going to have. Thanks so much for all the comments and the questions. Um, Paleo Party is going to be live streaming on Twitch every two weeks. And after each live stream, we're going to record it as a podcast, which will be available at multiple podcast repositories we haven't actually worked out how we're going to do that yet but we'll come to it later <laughs> um information on our next stream um upcoming guests and links are on links to our website are on our twitter page at paleo party um so don't forget to drop us a follow there and drop us a follow here um if you have any questions or any feedback we'd love to hear from you and i just want to say an extra special thank you to our guest <laughs> hannah for being our first ever paleo party guest and for having a lovely chat about who uh so a mini mini round of applause for hannah and thank uh you. thank you very much for tuning into paleo party and we will see you all again in in two weeks time so bye everyone thanks for coming see you later <laughs> bye you. bye